Thank you, Barbara. We often do Barbara L and Barbara C because we're both, you know, I, I help her out on some of this conference stuff. I have the great pleasure of introducing Mari Nakahara. Mari Nakahara is the Curator of Architecture, Design, and Engineering at the Library of Congress. And I will say, re reading her bio, it's a position I think that she has engineered herself, architect herself, designed almost to get to in the way she's done her uh, career. She has a PhD from Tokyo Metropolitan University in architectural history and design. And while working on her uh, PhD and other academic efforts, she worked in the McKin, Mead, and White archives in various ones in the United States. And that gave her the interest of being an archivist of architectural material. She has a um, master's of library science from Catholic University and has worked at New York Public Library at the Skyscraper Museum, at the Octagon in Washington, which is the, um, the Architects, uh, the American Institute of Architects um, Library. And for eight years, she was the, at the Japanese, um, curator of Japanese collections in the Asian collection at the Library of Congress. But now, since uh, 2015, She's been in the prints and photographs division, looking over, taking care of the architectural design and engineering materials. Mari has written on many topics. Her, the major work is called Crafting of, the, of a Modern World, the Architecture and Design of Antonin and Naomi Raymond. Um, Raymond was a Czech-American architect who went to Japan with Frank Lloyd Wright for the um, Imperial Hotel and then stayed and did major, major work in Japan. Recently, she's uh, been a co-author on a publication about Sakura, about the cherry blossoms in Washington. And so I think the talk that she is giving today is really interesting. Uh, the Unity of, uh, of Creation, designed by Wien Ries. And as I've looked at parts of this talk, it's almost like it must have been a, a jigsaw puzzle, looking at all of these bits of ephemera of his drawings and then trying to determine what of his many, many projects they came from. So I think you'll find it fascinating. Mari? Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, hello, everybody. My name is Mari Nakahara. I'm a curator at the um, Prints and Photographs Division at the library. And uh, I just manage the architecture design and um, engineering drawings and the collections. So you can imagine architecture collection um, very far, like various materials, photographs, drawings, and ephemeral collections. But um, this is actually the first time that I participate and then speak at the ephemeral collection. And sort of many things before I submit my paper. But I will just go through that. And then to begin with, my eyeglasses. And I'm honored to be uh, selected as a, one of the speakers today. And I would like to express my um, appreciation, especially for the board members and Barbara Charles who guided me to be able to talk to, um, this presentation today. And I also would like to express Runeta Rice, uh, grand daughter in, uh, I mean, sorry, daughter in law of the Vino Rice. And um, she actually provided some of the digital contents as a right free. Marion Kushner, a curator at the New York Historical Society, Ford Petras, my predecessor, and Helena Zinka, my chief who actually made an effort for me to be able to be present in person because of this COVID difficult time. So I'm excited also a lot more about ephemeral collections and how ephemera were used in the architectural field through everybody's um, presentation. I have seen already two, and I've been thinking about what really ephemera collection means in the architectural field. So as my presentation title says, uh, I will be talking about the work of the Vino de Rice using ephemera from his own materials as well as libraries, other visual collections. So 
So not many people may be aware of who he was. So who was really Bino Rice? So in 1911 and 1912, Rice attended the Munich School of Applied Arts, where he studied life and figure drawing, as, as well as interior and industrial design. In 1912, Rice entered the Munich Royal Academy of Fine Arts and studied under Franz, uh, Franz von Stack. Rice emigrated from Germany to the United States in 1913. For the first year of his life in New York City, his work was dedicated to the graphic designs that he knew well enough from the, his training in Germany. Rice explored the city and then started communicating with people and companies through his German connection, as I did through the Japanese collection. Um, for instance, he found a gallery on the, a German Ernst Hofstadt, who eventually would become Rice's gallerist later on. Rice also uh, began to work for the International Art Service, where he could communicate in German, and who appreciated Rice's design, knowledge, skill, and style, which he established while in Germany. <coughs> While he continued graphic design, his rest of life led him to a desire to teach and finally an establishment of the, his own school in 1916. He also began to design interiors. The interior design for the Busy Lady Bakery, shown here to your left, was the first commissioned interior work in 1915. His magazine cover design for the Modern Art Collector, also known as MAC, uh, which he co-published, appeared during he, its short run between only 1915 and 1918. By 1915 through 1916, Rice had built up his reputation in art and the design field. You may also know Vino Rice for, for his strong portraiture. Um, he's very famous for that. In 1920, he started drawing portraits of Blackfeet elders in Montana. He was very passionate and interested in Native Americans, even since he was a little boy. He continued to paint throughout his life, and some of these paintings were used for the Great Northern Railway calendars and the design for the Longshan Restaurant, uh, located at 624 Madison Avenue. So if you closely look at the background of the portrait of the lazy boy here, these, um, you can actually see the same motifs in the sketch for the Lanshan restaurant here. In 1920s, he also began to capture figures of the Harlem Renaissance leaders. Despite his fame as a graphic designer and a painter, I don't think he has yet been properly evaluated as a designer for architecture. I am really hoping that this year's exhibition on rice at the New York Historical Society will generate more interest and awareness in rice's work. The image of the Langston Hughes on the right side is the cover image of the catalog for the exhibition, which already available, because the exhibition was supposed to be last year, but they postponed to this year. So lucky you, you can go to the New York <laughs> Historical Society, start July. So this is my big question. question. When I saw a call for the Ephemeral Society a conference focusing on the architecture, I really wondered a little bit um, about exactly what ephemeral collection related to architecture would be, especially from the archive viewpoint where I work. Can they be like a sketches on the scrap paper or napkins? Or does the size of the item really matter? I think the really, um, definition can be varied depending on collections or how we observe the items and their organization. However, I have set my own definition of the architectural ephemera as miscellaneous sketches, especially those without any identification of the project, uh, project names, or assembled without particular order. 
So in the following slides, the items whose captions are written in blue are those I consider as ephemera. So let's start looking into it. So blue one in the middle, I consider as ephemera. So again, my presentation today is to introduce and verify Bino de Rice as a designer for architecture. I would like to talk about the unity of design in amazing spaces that Rice created in New York City. From murals, furniture, dishware, and even menus and lobby cars. Comparing many untitled sketches with black and white photographs, I learned how he developed his ideas throughout his design process. Here is first example, restaurant and a cafe Creon at 277 Park Avenue in New York City, designed in 1919. The cafe was located on the ground floor and a restaurant was on the second floor connected by the staircase. So it was a post-war time when immigrants like mm -hmm. Rice began to play an important role in craft and design. The sketch in the center shows interior decoration of the arch and the columns. Looking at final design in photo, curves and the dots in the arch remain the same from the time when he was sketching, but a motif for the columns has completely changed. So we can see his color scheme in the sketch which is important information since neither the restaurant, cafe, nor a color photographs from the days when the space was completed exist, at least in the library collection. This sketch shows various studies for columns and possibly arches for restaurant Creon. The motif he used as the final design for the arch is confirmed in the sketch enclosed in the red dotted line. Uh, yeah. So you can confirm the design. However, no connections between column sketches and the columns shown in the photo <laughs> can be found. So such finding is also important for the designer or for scholars because it verifies that Rice took a totally different approach from the heavy decorated columns to a more simplified design. A blown up photo shows one of the mural at the restaurant Creon. You will see three different uh, schemes in the sketch sheet, one of which is similar to the final design with a motif of the bird. A sketch sheet on the right is the same one that I showed in the last slide. You see that bird here too. Here. Rice often applied peasant style gardens of tulips, sunflowers, daisies, birds, and a fauna. The arch along the mural sketch shows a further developed design which matches to the final design. So three colored sketches um, show Rice's idea for the stage light wall screen decorations at Cafe Creon. So these, especially two on your right, are not quite ephemera to me. Uh, I am showing them because I think it's important to understand Rice's total design. The Creon was located near the theater district in New York City, New York mm -hmm. City so therefore, many people came before the shows and enjoyed the atmosphere of the theater during supper. Each decoration was lit from the backside, so it was lighting. So I also noticed that Rice repurposed his sketches to design other interior elements. For instance, a sketch shown here was also intended for a stage light wall decoration for Cafe Creon, but he tweaked and created a service area screen to hide used dishes, extra glasses, or water pitcher, as seen in the photo in the center. Rice's skill as a graphic designer largely contributed 
to unite a space from a large scale interior design to a small scale such as menu or lobby cars as shown here. You see a menu in the enlarged photo showing the tabletop. Unique graphic feature is a font, especially letter S. Uh, Rice used this font style for his own name, like a Rice, W-S, um, own name, like letterhead shown here, the bottom left. So since I touched on Rice's study of lettering or font, I may want to briefly introduce his, uh, this slide now, even though I veer from architecture topic a little bit. So these shows um, show his design studies of the label and the logo for Rapark beer. The logo studies are very small. Most of them are uh, smaller than one by two inches. There are nearly 70 of them in the collection. The next project is a Hotel Alamak. The left side of the slide is a luggage label for the hotel from the prints and photographs division's Razao collection, which contains nearly 1,900 USA hotel labels. The graphic arts collection in the prints and photographs division include more ephemera. Please check them via our online catalog, the link for which I will introduce in the later slide. Three sketches are shown on the right. Uh, I don't consider one showing the Pierrot as an ephemera, but wanted to show along with a colored photo of a mural. The Aramak building still stands even after Aramak went out of business. Somehow mural survived and it came up to the auction and one of these have been held at the Rice Archive. So these two set of the sketches enable us to trace Rice's design development and the color scheme study. The left set shows a seating booth and the murals at the Hotel Alamak. The one on the left is a sketch for the medieval grill room, and the other is a colored illustration for the Africa room. So they are very identical, but we could identify what room these drawings were for based on different mural motifs. Rice applied gray monotone for the main wall and the ceiling, with cobalt blue for seating and the trim. Then he added vivid color for murals. A set of the perspective studies on the right are the for, uh, for the hallway of the hotel from slightly different angles. The sketch shows the same color application, monotone on the wall and a cobalt blue for the trim. So application of the same color scheme also in indicates unity of the space as a whole. So this is a Congo room in the Hotel Amak. A little bit crazy. <laughs> Walls are covered by murals of animals such as snakes, monkeys, and tigers. And the rice even designed the dishware with sketches shown on the right. So lions and the monkeys are trimming the plates. So six small sketches mounted on a paperboard, this one, uh, shown on the left, uh, also for the Congo room at the Hotel Aramak. A sketch for the gate with an African mask motif shown on the top right, this one, was translated into the abstract geometric, geometric shapes when the gate was built. However, materials and the 3D effect he implemented drew more people's attention to the space. A menu for the Congo room with motif of the African masks also is shown on the right. The third project I would like to introduce from here is a little bit complicated. <laughs> it's a shellboard apartment in Kew Garden, New York. While I could guess that the original sketch on your right was for stair railing, but I was not really fully sure what project this sketch was for or if this was really for a stair railing until I found a photo in the middle. 
From the sketch, you can learn Rice's idea of applying golden metallic color, which gave a rating a richer appearance, which can't be seen in black and white photos. For the actual produce production, he used the Dupont Duco, a cutting edge, relatively inexpensive and a durable paint in the 1920s, and a successfully created the same effect that he attempted. The left sketch is a mirrored image of the original sketch I digitally created. So Guriel Prada matches to the photo. I often found small sketches not necessary for one project were assembled on the one paper board, often on both sides, which confuses the start researchers. Uh, two sheets uh, shown on the right are recto and a balso of one paper board. So the one at the bottom includes two sketches, possibly for two different projects, and the other on the top, also enlarged in the middle, includes two long strip sketches. So these elevations, um, elevation sketches are for the main lobby of the Shelbourne apartment. At the top, two adjoining walls are described as one strip sketch, which also makes people really confused. The two single doors, which are for elevators, were originally designed symmetrically, but the final design appearing in the photo shows as um, asymmetrical design. On the other hand, looking at the photo and the sketch at the bottom, we found, main, we found he maintained the symmetrical design for the double-sided entrance door. That makes sense because the function, elevator, and the main entrance doors are different. So here's another example of the grill work. So we are wondering for a while about the appropriate orientation of these two sketches mounted on the paper board on the right. So going through photographs, I learned that Rice applied the same design at the different locations of the building uh, by rotating it upside down, which was made possible because the nature of the geometry. So this is a more sophisticated color drawing, which I don't consider as an ephemera, for the seating mural at the Shelbourne apartment. Uh, but I wanted to introduce that to emphasize Rice's involvement in the total design for the building. The orientation of the final mural was created by, just follow me please, rotating the original 90 degrees counterclockwise and then mirrored <laughs> as I created this study shown in the middle. So Rice also designed lighting fixtures for the Shelbourne apartment. Triangular motifs are seen both in the photo and the sketches. Finally, the stand was made of metal, while the jade color in the sketches reflects his idea of creating lamp stand with plastic and other new materials in 1920s. Rice was always looking for the latest thing. <laughs> I would like to touch a little bit on Rice's furniture design, especially table and the chair designs in the next two slides. This is a teeny about four by four inch sketch for a chair designed for a cafe in the Hotel St. George in Brooklyn. Chairs are a challenging component to design because it's not simply designed based on graphical interest. Design involves structure st stability, materials and the comfort in the final product. And these sketches on Rice's letterhead show proposed design for the chair and the table for the Longchamp restaurant. While the photo implies that test samples are made, high cost prevented the restaurant owner from moving forward to manufacture neither tables nor chairs. For such cases, even sketches will help us understand his design approach. The last project I introduced is Rice's mural design for the facade of the music hall, 
for the 1964 New York World's Fair. Uh, I'm sorry, 1939 New York World's Fair. This is a Greyhound Grand Tour brochure, which features the music hall at the bottom left. I found this item in the prints and photographs division's John Margolis collection. Margolis drove around and documented vernacular commercial structures along Main Street, byways, and highways through the United States in the 20th century, a project called Roadside America. You will find many boxes containing ephemera he collected, such as this brochure and a restaurant placemat in his collection. So Rice studied various designs for the mural, like shown here, an ancient musician with a liar, a liar shaped with a peasant-style tulip, and so on, randomly drawn on the papers. The middle image shows the marquee for the final design of the facade of the music hall. In the sketch on the right, you will see two different types of the cornucopia. One looks like a lufa, and the other looks like a conch. <laughs> he also carefully studied how the angel holds the cornucopia here. It's a little bit small. But see fingers on the top right marked with a red dot. You know, he has studies of those things. <coughs> and Grease in the photostat on the right gives a clue how Rice determines to lay out each component together, like angel and crowds, musical notes, and a long-haired theater mask. Here's a postcard showing the music hall as a build, most likely a scene during the night with spotlights, while the accuracy of the colors is in, a, in a postcard is a little bit questionable. Uh, composition of the mus uh, mural is quite accurate. It also provides an atmosphere of the site, which must have intrig intrigued uh, more people to visit the fair. Lives of the building constructed for fairs, not limited to the New York World Fair in general, tend to be short, and the most of other documents for the 1939 New York World Fair were recorded in black and white. So after all, ephemera, such as this postcard, plays a significant role as an evidence for the site and the building. I hope my presentation verified, one, Rice's contribution to the world of art and architecture, two, his approach for unity of creation resulted in giving visitors a richer experience of the sh space beyond its intended function. For instance, people could encounter and enjoy something more than dining or drinking when they visited restaurants Rice designed, and three, how ephemera collection can assist us in connecting his initial ideas to the final designs which can no longer be confirmed by our own eyes because most of the buildings have been demolished or do not remain as built even though the structure still stands. As my predecessor Ford Petrus said, quote, it's no exaggeration to propose that in many ways Rice enlivened set new standards for and redefine a number of these forms, many integral to American modernism. I am listing here in some useful resources to search the prints and photographs division collection in general, and its architecture design and engineering collections, and the rice collection in particular. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email or you can generally send an email to um, through the Ask a Library. Thank you very much. Yes. Please do not send me any difficult questions. I confess I'm not a rice specialist, for the Petrus is a specialist. A, a, a question for you, Mari. Yes. Thank you. Going back to the beginning, He's arrived in New York in 1913. We see very little 
from 1915 to 1920. Do you think that's part of the backlash against Germans because of the war? It, did that play into it, or is it the, just his lack of experience and he starts really working at the, was it the Creon, the Creon in 1920? Well, Creon is 1919, but 1915, 16, that, uh, 1916, he actually uh, established his own school. So he was really active, but he was aware of the, the war, and he was sometimes back and forth, I think. And his, his wife was not with him when he arrived in 1913. So she finally joined, I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, later on, it was a rice. So, but he was not stopping, he was paying attention, and um, as I mentioned, he was a little bit burned out by doing the graphic design. I can easily imagine as an immigrant that how difficult the first few years would be. You know, I only had three part-time jobs, and day by day, I had no idea of uh, American society that I was always told, no, you can work up to 21 hours, and then, uh, but I have more time. And then, no, 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 21 hours is enough, because exceeding 21 hours that I learned that they have to cover the benefit. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think he went through, all the immigrants went through. But uh, from my viewpoint, he was really skillful and uh, successful, and many, like a German-related connection really helped him establish his career in the United States. Uh, are there any surviving uh, examples of his architecture that can be seen? Um, yes, Shelbourne apartment is still stunned, and Alamak uh, is still, still stunned, but uh, you, you can never experience the atmosphere that he intended. Because if you go to, if you have an internet connection, please go to the Sherbourne apartment. I was so disappointed. Because, because um, I thought when I looked at the current situation that it would be better that they completely change the, the theme or design and then just build the new interior rather than kind of replicate and then try to do the same which they couldn't or they can't. I think it's, you know, first of all, that materials cost, and then everything is different. And Kara, you know, he, he used the DuPont Duco, and um, it was inexpensive. I don't know the market of the DuPont Duco, the current value, but not the same Kara. And the popularity of the, you know, everybody likes the open concept nowadays, which were not available, and all of the uh, preference of the building interior or space have been changing and it's almost impossible to sustain the same design method and uh, ideas from 1920s up to now. Um, you know, current, which I see like a younger generation really likes the mid-century, modern 1950s, but not many people like them back to 1920s. So um, it, it's really disappointing how the, uh, well, please look at the Shelbourne apartment. Elevators, those um, grill work design is gone. It's like a simple metal door. So the color is like, um, I use the word jade green. It's there, but it's different. <laughs> so, but you can still feel, you know, the space, not the interior design. Mari, among the uh, records at the library or elsewhere, do actual records exist of the manufacturers of paints he's using so you can really identify the color or the manufacturers of the metals or those kind of architectural details? I am not fully sure about it, but Ford probably can tell about it. Um, luckily, the Rice Archive in upstate New York that uh, Renetta Rice um, maintains, that they might have some record of that. Because without having it, the DuPont Duco, I actually learned from Ford that, um, so he must have found somewhere, or magazines or you know, old publication might have mentioned about such things in there. But I am not fully sure if the color sample and these things. Well, if, if we know DuPont Duco, that the DuPont Duco might have color sample. Right. Yeah. I also do, does, does Balin paint show up on any of those? Can, can you use the microphone? I'm sorry. Sorry, Jeff, the audible's not 
fascinated by this. Uh, did Balin paint show up on any of that? I am not sure. I okay, I, I thought I I'd seen it no in your material. They were, they were a, a, a Staten Island paint maker that mm. I think we could find the color samples for. And I think like, uh, I don't know, I have to contact the building museum in Washington. They tend to collect like uh, catalogs and uh, these things. And uh, in our collection, sometimes that we acquire the materials and color samples, we recently processed the Charles Goodman collection and the color samples, floor samples, but there's no verification that he really used them. You know, companies send them as a sample, but we have no verification that he used it. For those cases that we do not keep them, then it goes somewhere else. We have a science technology business section that which um, collects some of the technical things, but they don't collect samples. Uh, how much of his uh, railroad work survives as ephemera? And I know like the Cincinnati Railroad Station was one of his great projects. Yes. Is there any of that still exist? Or at least you should be able to find ephemera from railroad stuff about his designs. It could be. Um, and then I believe that original ephemera should be in a rice archive. And other materials which verifies his design in our collection is not from the rice collection, only the photos from Carol Heisman's. Or it's not ephemera. I don't consider photos as ephemera. So, but there are some verification of the materials in our collection, and also for probably somewhere else. Uh, we have great railroad collection. Uh, Professor Louis Marais took all the pictures of the rail, rail, railroad and then, you know, locomotives and the stations that if we dig out, we might have some of the verifications. Thank you. Well, this will be the last question. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, there are some of his designs, no, uh, his poster stamps for the railroads, the little little posters, mm -hmm. and I sent you an image if I remember. And uh, th 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 obviously, he was in touch with the uh, the modernist uh, schools in Germany even after he left. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, one of the designs reminded me very much of Ulbricht's uh, uh, design, the Austrian Secession, and then of course. Later, the, uh, the the Bauhaus, the Bauhaus work. So even though he was trained in Munich, I suspect he had contact with with, with all of these various movements. Okay, thank you. If I might interject, I have a a, a fair amount of rice uh, ephemera stuff, which I actually have in my car. Uh, but <laughs> the, uh, the the Cincinnati Railroad Terminal has been uh, really, really done up nice. Uh, the mosaics he did are there. Some of the mosaics he did are in the airline terminal uh, for Cincinnati, and there's one set of mosaics on a building in downtown Cincinnati. Uh, he was a, a master of many different uh, aspects of craft. He, uh, as alluded to, uh, did a lot of American Indian paintings in the Glacier National Park area. He was a, a great supporter of the Harlem Renaissance and did magazine covers. Uh, graphic design work in a lot of magazines, uh, and if anyone wants to see it, you can see it after, after at lunchtime after the talks. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.